to God be the glory. In the long ago, Solomon said, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Maybe the most challenging passage in all the Bible that holds us to this is Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. I hope you have your Bible. Will you turn there with us to Philippians chapter 4 as we study together the Word of God and we see another portion of the light of the world. In 1987, on their blockbuster album, The Joshua Tree, U2 sang a song entitled, Where the Streets Have No Names. Their song is metaphorical, but did you know that there is a major city in Central America where the streets actually have no names? It's Managua, Nicaragua. A city of almost two and a half million has no street names to get or to give directions. You gotta refer to landmarks. But civil war and a major earthquake have destroyed many of those landmarks. It can be so confusing, especially for visitors to the city. Most of us can relate to how maddening it would be if our homes or our businesses or other destinations were on streets with no names, but more and more are trying to live morally without clear guidance from God's Word. Instead, they rely on themselves or on directions from others who may or may not know the right way. It's just all trial and error. You know, it's a terrible feeling to wander and to feel lost. David said, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. A major concern expressed by especially those of our most seasoned saints is a decline in the moral behavior of our nation. We could give statistics about the legalization of abortion or gambling or pornography and same-sex marriage or the rise in fornication and adultery or the decrease in faith in God and Christ in our culture. We could quote our founding fathers as they embraced the importance of a Bible-based morality. George Washington said that religion and morality are the essential pillars of civil society. His successor, John Adams, said, We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Immorality would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. And then the dictionary guy, Noah Webster, said, All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. But there is a word used four times in the New Testament that means uncommon character worthy of praise and outstanding goodness. It's a word meaning the excellence that the righteous are to maintain in life and in death. Homer used the word primarily of military valor and exploits, but also of distinction for other personal qualities and actions that got people's attentions. It's the excellence that's required in a person who is morally upright. But it is the Bible that can tell us how that's measured and what it looks like. For example, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, according as his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love." There in 2 Peter 1, 3 through 7, Peter tells us that through God's precious and great promises, we can become partakers of the divine nature. To partake means to share or to have fellowship with. As He is, so we can be. In that very context, Peter tells us that God calls us by His moral excellence, and He calls us to that moral excellence. In other words, He summons us to share a quality that characterizes Him, and we partake of it as we escape the world's corruption. Two of the four occurrences of this word refers to God's excellence. The other two refer to our living the Christian life. One is 2 Peter 1.5, and the other that refers to us 
is Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence or if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Philippians 4, 8. The context of this passage is in a book that speaks of the importance of how we think and our mindset. He uses a word seven times that speaks of being of the right mind or attitude or concern. For example, in Philippians 2, 2 and 3, he says, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in purpose, intent on one purpose, doing nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with lowliness of mind, each regarding others as more important than themselves. It is the same word for the attitude of Christ that we must have. Let this mind be in you. Philippians 2.5 The word translated dwell in our passage is a different word, meaning to determine by, by mathematical process to calculate, or a commercial term, meaning to charge or to reckon. Paul is not asking for mere reflection on a principle but for the practical consideration that leads to action. What is Paul asking us to calculate and consider in order to do? Everything in that list that you find in Philippians 4 and verse 8 are things that will lead us to moral excellence if we will do them. I want to supplement my faith with virtue, as Peter urges. I want to incorporate those things that lead to excellence. So let's look at these qualities in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 that lead us to restore moral excellence in our own lives. So what are those qualities? Number one, Paul says, be true. This word carries with it the idea of being truthful, but also being in accordance with fact and truth. Even though they were trying to trap Jesus, the Pharisees' disciples and the Herodians Describe the word well, saying of Jesus, Teacher, we know that you are truthful, and you teach the way of God in truth, and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Now, they were only flattering Him for their own purposes, but their description of Jesus was spot on. Because He was truthful, He taught the truth. Because He was truthful, He sought no one's favor and because he was truthful, he did not act in a certain way because he was afraid of what someone might think. What a definition. Throughout the New Testament, this word true is applied to testimony, proverbs, teaching, and words. But Philippians 4.8 indicates that it's more than that. It's whatever. Whatever is true. How often is our character and integrity put to the test when we are tempted to be untrue? Maybe it's being dishonest or stealing time or money from an employer or a client. In Ephesians 4.28, Paul says, He who steals must steal no longer, but he must rather labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he may have something to share with one who has need. Maybe it's being unfaithful to our marriage vows or starting down that path with someone. Maybe it's practicing favoritism within the context of the church. James says in James 2 and verse 1, My brethren, do not hold your faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Maybe it's letting our anger boil over when we're provoked and sinning in our speech or our physical response. Paul says in the same context in Ephesians 4, 26, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. Maybe it's general immorality in our ways. Proverbs 13, 5 says, A righteous man hates falsehood, but a wicked man acts dis disgustingly and shamefully. But righteousness guards the one whose way is blameless, but wickedness subverts the sinner. It's not just the outward appearance of truth that Paul calls us to possess. It's what David calls for in Psalm 15, 1 and 2. He says, O Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill, he who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. The idea is of being authentic, the real deal. Not just pretending or being something skin deep. John says, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him, 1 John 2 and verse 4. 
Hypocrisy and insincerity are antagonistic to moral excellence. We have such a responsibility to let our lives ring true for people to be able to look into our lives and to see us living. What we say that we believe, especially in our divided culture, those who are secular and anti-religious assume that Christians are all hypocrites. We have an opportunity to explode the stereotype, but it requires us to concentrate on being true. Howard Walter was teaching English in Waseda University in Tokyo, Japan in 1906. He was only 23 years old when he wrote a poem he entitled, My Creed. He sent it to his mother, who submitted it to Harper's Weekly. They published it the next year. He had graduated with honors from Princeton in 1905, but he wanted to be a missionary. Doctors advised against his going overseas because he had a weak heart. But he worked not only in Japan, but in Sri Lanka and in India, where he died in the flu pandemic of 1918. He was only 35. The first line of his poem is the most famous. Before his death, it had been made into a hymn. I would be true, for there are those who trust me. No wonder he acted with such faith and fearlessness with a creed like that. We have it within us to do great things that impact our world if we have that inward integrity to be true. Moral excellence, it requires you to be true. But then number two, it requires you to be honorable. Now this word is found four times in the New Testament, and the other three times it's translated dignified and is required of deacons, women, and older men in 1 Timothy and Titus. The word actually means lofty and majestic, and it was used in secular Greek society of music and poetry and, and a sp a public speaking. But the word in the New Testament refers to a quality within us that people connect with God's character and nature. They're not awed or amazed by us, but by seeing the evidence of Christ living in us. Paul is thinking about how outsiders see us, and he urges us to think about and to practice what is serious and noble and worthy of reverence. It implies dignity and being worthy of respect. You know, Turkish researchers and twin sisters, Keelan and Selin Kesebir, recently published a study on the cultural relevance of moral character and virtue as it's declined in 20th century America. These Ph.D. professors of psychology searched 5.2 million American books from 1901 to 2000 archived on Google Books to track if morality and virtue terms declined throughout the century. They found that 10 words most often used to describe the general moral worth of a person, including dignity and virtue, overwhelmingly declined, and words related to the care or concern uh, for others declined the most at 74%. At the conclusion of their study, which I own, they said, people simply do not think about, talk about, write about morality and virtue as much anymore. The vocabulary for talking about issues of good and bad, right and wrong, thus seem to be shrinking. Our culture needs a serious restoration of moral excellence, of people who act honorably and with dignity. Paul tells Christians to set the pace in this by setting our minds on honorable actions that help people see God in us. It's interesting to look at the root word in this word honorable, where it comes from, a word that's used to describe devout Cornelius in Acts 10, the God-fearing proselytes of Acts 13, the worshiper Lydia in Acts 16, and Titius Justus in Acts 18. It's no wonder the church grew so rapidly and transformed their culture with such spiritually lofty folks. Paul's word for godliness that dominates 1 Timothy is from the same word family. Our world desperately needs examples of people who will be honorable in their dealings with others. Moral excellence, how do we get that? Well, in the third place, Paul says, do right. In almost 80 New Testament references, the word is most often translated righteous and just. This word suggests fulfilling obligations being faithful to others and faithful to God, being in a right relationship with someone. In Romans 1.17, the Bible says, For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. We think about the implications of this in our interactions with this world. We must be upright and just, conforming to God's standards in our dealings with others. Think about our various relationships with others. 
I will not try to live above the laws of the land, whether cheating on my taxes or driving aggressively. I will honor the laws of the land because I know that this is the same as honoring God who ordained them, Romans 13. I will keep a sharp conscience that keeps me from taking advantage of somebody I do business with, whether I'm selling a vehicle or billing them for work I didn't do. I won't try to think of ways to do the wrong thing without getting caught by rationalizing or renaming it or by shifting the blame to others. I will live a law-abiding and conscientious life before my children whose ethics and morality are guided by my own, by me having a true north on my moral compass. This word is used of God Himself. In 1 John 2, 29, John says, If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who, uh, also who practices righteousness is born of Him. It's used several times of Jesus. 1 John 2, 1, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so we're not surprised at John's inspired conclusion. 1 John 3, 7, Little children, make sure that no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. In Philippians 4, 8, right or just is action in accordance with God's will. It's used the same way in, in Titus 2 and verse 12, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Moral excellence. Fourth, to have it, we must be pure. The Philippians were surrounded by what was unchaste and impure. Barclay says that when used ceremonially, the word describes something so clean it's fit to be brought into the presence of God and used in the service of God. You know, we live in a world that tries to make everything impure and dirty, and it can infect our minds and thinking. Paul uses a different word for pure in Titus 1.15 to convey this problem of failing to practice pure thinking. He says, To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and abominable nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. The word pure applies in a multitude of, of contexts. How about our motives? Some proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition and not pure motives, Philippians 1.17. Or our general conduct. Paul says to the Corinthians, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. In everything you demonstrated yourself to be pure or innocent in the matter. 2 Corinthians 7.10 and 11. How about our ethics and morals? Keep yourself pure from sin, 1 Timothy 5.22. Our world gives no thought to trying to remain pure in these ways. Paul is telling us that against that trend, we must fight and win the battle of the heart against impurity. Our mind is the best predictor of our future. Someone has said, you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. If we fill our mind with impure thoughts, our bodies find a way to fulfill those desires. Jesus warns that filling our hearts with impurity leads to impurity of life. He says, For from within, out of the hearts of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Mark 7, 21-23. Weekly World News reported that an Indian farmer had some killer bad breath. He was charged with manslaughter after killing a police officer with his rancid breath. While attempting to arrest Raji Bhattachara, the officer smelled the curry on his breath and he died from an asthma attack. How much harm are we doing to ourselves and our influence with others by what's inside of us that's showing up on the outside? Matthew 5, 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We can't keep pure thoughts without taking action to rid ourselves of things that make us impure. Can you imagine trying to clean up while lying in a mud hole? We must avoid things that promote sensuality, crudeness, violence, hatred, greed, and whatever else displeases God. Moral excellence. How do we achieve that? Next, the verse says, do what's lovely. Some of the most physically attractive people we meet are repulsive because of how they act. They complain, 
are foul-mouthed, self-absorbed, sarcastic, arrogant, and slanderous. And in the same way, we all know people who may look homely on the outside, but whose inner beauty radiates. Was it Forrest Gump who said, pretty is as pretty does? You know, it actually goes back to Chaucer in the late 14th century. But the idea of loveliness being a product of the thinking is thoroughly biblical, as Paul states it right here. This word only appears in Philippians 4, 8, and it means that which causes people to be pleased with or delighted with something. As we mentioned, people may seek pleasure for impure thoughts, sights, and deeds, but there are those things that fill one with genuine delight and pleasure that is not tinged at all with guilt or filth. Paul is calling for us to think on those kinds of things. The word literally meant love-inspiring, attractive, agreeable. The comparison is made to a pleasant fragrance, the sight of a majestic mountain range, or the sound of an ocean breeze as waves gently crash against the shore. But Paul is speaking in a spiritual sense about spiritual things. Whatever is valuable and dear to the heart of man, My middle son, uh, Dale, is a preacher in North Alabama, and his elders asked him to take pictures and shoot video of his visits to share on social media in the height of the pandemic. I'm enjoying listening to his conversations with elderly members who reminisce about their childhood or a spouse who has passed away. Hearts who refresh the hearts of the saints are lovely hearts. Philemon 1, verse 7 and 20. Philemon apparently had a lovely heart. Paul said it refreshed His heart. You know, I have received little cards from little children. It's one of the blessings uh, I have as a preacher. One little girl sent me a card that quoted Psalm 100 in verse 1, and it said, Happy Halloween. And my favorite part, she said, I like your sermons. She drew a pumpkin on the front. I don't know the last time I received anything more lovely, and it was most lovely because of the heart that thought to give it to me. That's moral excellence. Finally, what is moral excellence? It's that which we do that is of good repute. That's how Paul ends that list in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Of good repute. That pertains to what deserves approval, what is kind and likely to win people and to avoid what is likely to give offense. That nullifies a lot of what people put on social media whose words more likely inflame and agitate and draw angry emojis. Moral excellence involves a winsomeness that attracts people to Jesus. Some have made gentle, kind words and actions uh, equivalent with cowardice and compromise, but the Holy Spirit calls for a mind that dwells on the very things that elevate our reputation for warmth and appeal. We may recoil at the thought of dwelling on things that are not likely to offend if we're disgusted with our PC culture, but isn't there a balance between being afraid of standing up for what's right and being ugly and offensive when we do it? Moral excellence means having a reputation for saying and doing what's godly and helpful to others. From the early days of the church, God emphasizes the value of Christians with a good reputation, Elders and widows need a good reputation and a reputation of good works. Conduct that leads to good reputation starts with a heart that thinks about things that lead to a good reputation. It's quite a challenging list, isn't it? In Philippians 4 and verse 8. Mark Twain said, What a wee little part of a person's life are his acts and his words. His real life is led in his head and is known to none but himself. All day long, the mill of his brain is grinding, and his thoughts, not those other things, are his history. Excellent, praiseworthy lives start with thinking on these things that we've looked at today. Let your mind dwell on these things. Give serious consideration to these things. When you think on them, it will shape your conduct. Did you know that the average person has 10,000 separate thoughts per day or about 3.5 million thoughts per year? And someone says that if you live to be 75 years old, you'll have over 26 million different thoughts. But thoughts cannot stay thoughts. Paul follows up this list of things to think about by saying in Philippians 4 and verse 9, the things that you have learned and received 
and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. The things that Paul thought became things that others could learn, receive, hear, and see. His thoughts influenced what others did. They were all things that they could turn around and practice. You know, what we dwell on is that powerful. Her neighbors at Delray Beach, Florida called her Garbage Mary. She scrounged the garbage cans for food, which she hoarded in her car and in her two-room apartment. She begged cigarettes and ice cubes from people. But police finally identified her as Kathleen Colley, the daughter of a well-to-do Illinois lawyer and bank d- director. Detectives found evidence of bank books and stock securities, oil drilling rights and land holdings found in her car and her apartment that proved her to actually be a millionaire. This was front page news when it broke about 40 years ago. It begs the question, why would a millionaire live the life of a beggar? Is that worse than a child of God who scrounges through the garbage of sin, devouring what's worthless when we stand to inherit eternal life? What we dwell on determines what kind of identity we have. Paul said in Ephesians 4 and verse 20, But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. To restore moral excellence, we have got to dwell on the right things, that which is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and reputable. Those things. We can do it. God has shown us He would not call us to do something that we're not capable of accomplishing. May we do so, and by that, May we give those around us the best living example of moral excellence.